Hi, welcome to another video. So today I'm talking about SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. In particular, just the 8-bit version, keep it simple. I'll show you some code and some data sheets and a view on the scope. So this is obviously cut from one of Microchip's data sheets. This is obviously SPI1. So we've got Serial Data Out. Microchip call it SD01, which is RD0, port RD0. That's known as serial data out, is known as master out slave in. So the PIC microcontroller sends data out on this pin. This is obviously the clock. You see there, SCK1, so serial clock 1 for SPI1, that's on port RD10. And serial data in is SDI1, RC4, port RC4. So that's master in, slave out. So this microcontroller receives data in on the MISO. So MISO, master in, slave out. MOSI, master out, slave in. And let me just take you across to the other side of the picture where the SDI in is. And you see it's buried on the other side of the chip, RC4. Right, then you can see SPI2, so serial data out 2, serial data out, MOSI, so MOSI, also master out, slave in on RG8, SPI2, serial data in 2, serial data in, so MISO, master in, slave out, RG7, that's his air master in, slave out, and finally SPI2 clock, RG6. So obviously now you're getting the idea, SPI3, serial data out, MOSI, MOSI, master out, slave in, RF8, SPI3, serial data in, MISO, RF2, and the third, SPI clock, RD15, just in this corner of the chip. And last but not least, SPI4, serial data out, serial data in, and clock RF5, RF4, and SCK4. Well, so in my example, I'm using SPI3 running it to a memory card which has got the external fonts and pictures and a touch panel controller. So you know, so you now know the relevant pins on the microcontroller. So you've got serial data in, serial data out, and clock. And then you need, for the memory card, a chip select, which is defined in the software. And when you want to address this chip, either write or read from it, the chip select generally goes low, so it's tied high, and you pull it low, down to ground, to read this, read or write to it. Uh, and then when you finish with it, this chip select goes high again. And similarly with the touch panel controller I've got, ground the chip select, send data to it, read it back, and then the chip select goes high again. So you're not limited to two devices, probably not limited to any at all. So in this example on this picture, I've got it running to a third device, which I haven't actually got, but it could be a, like a temperature sensor, pressure sensor, humidity sensor, anything that runs on SPI. So it's fair enough communicating with a device that uses SPI but but when things don't work you need to understand why they're not working and what you can do to implement correction that sort of stuff so using this 8-bit touch controller on the back of the screen I thought I'll show you some signals on the scope so this is you will have seen from previous videos it's the XPT 2046 controller it can run at 8-bit or 12-bit data using 16-bit clock what I'll do, I'll reprogram this touchscreen and put a little box here so we can see when we're moving the X and Y coordinates. And hopefully it'll all make sense. Right, this is some of the code. And this is one of the common versions. There are many permutations to SPI, so don't take this as gospel. It can vary significantly. So first of all, using Microelectronica's MicroC Pro, or Micro C Pro for PIC32, which is this version. 
you initialize the SPI, and in this case it's SPI3, so initialize advanced, we're setting the microcontroller as the master, setting it to 8-bit, and we're dividing the clock here by 600. Now this microcontroller is running at 80 MHz, and I haven't got the peripheral clock divisor switched on, so in case you're wondering what the peripheral clock divisor is, if you, if you go up to Edit Settings, Edit Project, right, if we scroll down, so I've got the PLL multiplier set at 18, PLL input divider set to 2, but scroll down to the important bit, peripheral clock divisor, so this divides that peripheral clock which is used by the SPI device, so if you divide this, for example, by 8, you're going to slow the clock frequency down. But this current example is set to 1. So cancel that. So you can see I'm dividing the 80 MHz by 600. So let's see what sort of figure that gives us. So 80, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 80 million divided by 600 equals, that's actually 133,000 hertz, or 133 kilohertz. So if you look at the bottom picture, that dividing the clock by 600 actually equates to 120 kilohertz. So then you've got slave select disable, sample data at, in this example, at the end of the clock. The clock idles high and then comes down to turn on. Have a look at the picture bottom corner. You see it starts high, comes down, each clock pulse coming down, idles high, and then S this is SPI active to idle. So this is the data I'm writing to the touch panel controller. So this is the interrupt for the touch screen. This is the chip select I showed you in the drawing. This is going down to ground, so we're selecting that particular controller. And you see where SPI3 write, and there's my eight bits of data. So I'm doing it in binary format so you can understand, and makes it easier for me to understand too. But So there's the control bit, one. Then we're writing a 101, that does the X. This is eight bits mode, and then three zeros. We're then reading the buffer, so this buffer is 8 bits wide, and by reading that buffer, we're clearing, clearing it so it's ready to move on. This is SPI3 write, so I'm writing nothing, but it gives me 8 additional clock pulses. Then again, this is for the Y position, there's a control bit, then 001 is for the Y position, 1 is for 8 bit, and then 3 zeros. Now the data sheet says, I cannot write 1 before 11 clock bits have occurred. Can't write it again. But I wonder if that's excluding the read because without this dummy write and the dummy extra eight clock pulses, the touch panel would hang. I'll turn the microcontroller off at the power, turn it back on, and the Y wouldn't always work. It was erratic. Now, so if you've got a one there, followed by seven bits, so there's seven clock pulses, then we've got another 8 clock pulses here to read the buffer. So 7 and 8 is 15. But anyway, so this gives me an additional 8 clock pulses. 15 plus 8 is 23. And then I'm writing another bit there. So there's plenty of clock cycles before I'm writing another one. Anyway, so there's the further 8 clock pulses there. Another 8 clock pulses there and then touch panel chip select equals one. So I'll show you in the scope. Clock pulses start there, small delay, then another eight clock pulses, small delay, another eight, just blank, then another eight there for write, and another eight for read. But I'll show you the data in first, so these will be blank. And then I'll show you the data out, and show you how the data moves up the clock pulses to become more significant. So obviously, being a microcontroller, it's counting in hexadecimal. So in case you're not familiar, 
this is obviously a 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 and 128. So adding all these bits up, if I pull up the calculator so you understand, in case you're not familiar, calculator, go to view, programmer, so we've got eight, got it in a binary, so we've got eight bits of data, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and on a microcontroller you would read that as zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is 128, this is half of that, so 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2 and a 1. Decimal gives you 255 and hexadecimal is FF, which you, you might have seen those numbers before. So FF is a full 8-bit register. But what I'll show you on the scope is the values coming from the touch screen coming up. So now you know this is obviously 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. As a bit increments left, the value increases and that's how the microcontroller interprets what's coming back. Relates them to the existing eight clock pulses and where they are in the string determines their value. Well, so if I touch the screen, we'll catch the data out of the slave and into the microcontroller. And you see there's the clock pulses start, there's the data. Try and capture that. There we go. So it's synchronised because we got chip select. And remembering from the program, the data starts at the edge of the clock pulses. The clock idles high and comes down to switch on. So you see there's all the clock pulses coming down. 8, 8, 8, 8 and 8. And the SPI is idle to active. So there's the idle low and active high. And remembering to read the X, we had to write a control bit, which was 1. Then while this SPI is still on, we've got another clock pulse there, so that's another 1 at the edge of the clock pulse. Then we've got a 0. Then we've got two more 1s. And then three more zeros. Looking at these clock pulses. That's a 0, because there's nothing, nothing, nothing. One, one, nothing, one, one. So that's our X. We've got eight clock pulses there, which is the read buffer and the small delay. That's our dummy clock pulses before the next write. So to read the Y, you can see slightly different configuration. So we've got the 1 is the control bit. Then we've got 0, 0, 1, 1, and then three more zeros. So that's the data in. So we are reading the master in slave out line. So if I touch the screen, you'll see in the bottom right hand corner there's our clock pulses right so now because we've got a varying voltage coming back from the touch panel screen I wanted to show you how the SPI works in the form of hexadecimal and remember I said it's 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128 so if you see I'm touching in the bottom right hand window touching the edge of the touch panel. You can see it's flickering but you can see the data here on the scope where obviously down in one, two, around the fours and the ones and I can see on the screen a five on the X position so reading the X position only. So now if I move up the screen you can see this has jumped up to a more significant clock pulse and run up the screen you can see it moving up 
up and up and up. And it's just adding all those hexadecimal bits together. So trying to keep my hands still. See if we can capture this. Well, I think we've got 122 down in this corner down here. And let's see what we've got on the scope. So this is the 8 o'clock voltage for the data in. And this is the data out. 8 dummy clock pulses writing to ask for the Y and reading the Y. So let's just concentrate on this X, reading the X position. Right, so most significant bit up here. So that I've sussed this microcontroller, this, I've sussed this touchscreen controller doesn't fill the internal register, we never get 128 bit. Bit of a shame because it would be more accurate. So we've got no 128, we've got a 64, we've got a 32. Bear in mind this is high, so these count as ones, and these are nothings when the SPI is off. And the most significant clock pulse is up here on the left most significant bit down here in the SPI is on the left. So no 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, then we've got a nothing, and a nothing, and a 1. So if we add up 1, 2, 4, so we add up a 1, 8, 16, 32 and 64 we have a value of 121 and if I zoom you in to the touch screen we actually had do you remember it's flickering anyway we've got a value of 122 so let me just run that again touch the screen So you see, as the data decreases, the value bits come down, so there's hexadecimal values. So I'm down on the right hand part of the screen. Well, come off the screen, everything turns off. So back onto the screen, look in the bottom right hand corner. So we've got a value of 6 at the moment, which is at 2 and a 4. You can just see there, 2 and a 4. And moving up the screen, all starts jumping up and adding up the bits. And then coming back down. If I capture this on the smallest part on the display, we have so it's one, twos, and fours. So we've got a number four, and on the bottom corner, if I move you in, we've got a four. So that's the standard or one of the more common SPIs. So this one's synchronized with the clock pulses and the chip select. There's another one where, where the clock pulses will run continuously and then you have frame select pulse. So the, whether it's a touchscreen controller, temperature device, some special device would need a frame sync pulse and it would then synchronize the data with the clock. So I'll give you a quick example of that. Right, so I remove those slashes. I'm going to reprogram the microcontroller with these bits enabled. Luckily, microchip data sheet, they tell you what these bits do, but it's actually enabling the clock for framed 
sync SPI. So the TFT won't be able to synchronize because I haven't got a, a sync line. I've only got a chip select and the chip select does not act in this case for a sync line. It won't synchronize the data with the clock pulses. I'll enable this and show you on the scope. Right, there we go, that's the result. So now the SPI clock is running continually. And you see in the corner, well, running at 120 kilohertz, that's the 80 megs divided by 600, gives us that result. And so we're not touching the screen, so we've got no data at the moment. So if I close this up, you just see one continuous line of clock pulses. But now when I touch the screen, there's nothing to tell the touch panel or controller when to start reading the bits and at what bit along this clock pulse. So if I touch the screen now, and hopefully you can just see a faint bit of data coming back. If I get rid of the, if I move the clock pulses out of the way, Well, you can see those bits are just floating up and down because they're not synchronized. And they're not locked to any particular clock pulse. So let's have a look and see what results we got on the touch screen. Well, you can see the X and Y coordinates are moving, but you can see we're just getting random dots all over the place. Hopefully you see those dots appearing when I'm roughly in the middle. So you see it works, but nothing's coordinated, so the data is all corrupt. Anyway, so that's a continuous clock pulse with framed sync SPI. Right, I've turned off or disabled that framed SPI back to the normal. SPI with chip select. So there's all my pulses. I want to add a quick note some of the trouble I had with this touchscreen controller. Now generally on the I2C communication they use open collector transistors in the controllers and they need pull-up resistors. SPI don't generally need them but this controller was acting up I'd get spurious or erratic results. And if you have a look at the, this is the data when something else is happening, the clock pulses or interference coming from the TFT itself, that they certainly look like clock pulses. If I disconnect a pull-up resistor, which I added the other day, there we go, I had that. So you can see my SPI is meant to come back down to nothing, and you can see it's floating up. And that gives me corrupt data on the screen. Get odd intermittent behavior. Sometimes it comes up, sometimes it doesn't. It's less significant on the 16 bit, but for some reason on the 8 bit, you can see that data's shooting up and that just corrupts the data. So, in that example, all I did that's the slave out and master in. All I do is connect it to a resistor that's close to a 10k resistor and just pulling it down to ground. And that seemed to have eradicated that problem. So although this hasn't been about touch screen controllers, it's generally about 8-bit SPI interface. Problems you get in snags, that sort of stuff, the need for pull-up resistors, erratic data, erratic numbers. Hopefully you found this informative. Thank you very much.